My daughter can probably identify with about half of those, but the one that I know she identifies with is the one on what? You had a project that was assigned four weeks ago? We've never had that conversation much. But God kind of wires us in a specific way, and it really has to do with God's plan for raising a family and how he designs it to do it. And so this morning, dads, some of us have learned those sayings from our fathers. I find things doing that. But this morning's message is actually entitled, My Fine Father, and let's take a look at why. First, some background. If you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn to John chapter 5. We're going to be spending a lot of time in that particular chapter today. Jesus is uh, doing what he does best. He is out amongst the people. And in a story of a little bit of background here, John chapter 5, 1 through 17, he is at the pool of Bethesda. And this is a story that a lot of people know. We have a picture here of uh, in Israel now, what the area by the Sheep Gate known as uh, the Pool of Bethesda looks like. But in Jesus' time, it probably looked a little more like this. And there were five covered colonnades that went down. You had the four on all sides, and then the one in the middle, you had the two pools there. And it was believed that once a day, an angel came down and stirred the pools, and that the first person into the pool would be healed. And Jesus shows up at this place, and one man, among many, really kind of gets Jesus' attention. Uh, the Bible says that he had been there for a while. We don't know how long he had been uh, coming to the actual pool at Bethesda. We know it was for a while. But we also know that he had uh, been a cripple for 38 years. You know, at times I try to think about there are people that have, in their lives, waited a long time for God to show up and do something. And I want you to consider being uh, a cripple for 38 years, 13,870 days. He had been waiting for something to happen. That's 365 times 38. I'm not a math whiz. I have a calculator on my phone. 13,870 days. There are times that we pray for something for a week. There are times that we pray for something for a month. If we're really good, we get it in for six months. 13,870 days, this guy had been waiting around. Jesus focuses on this guy. When Jesus comes up to him, he does not say, You're Jesus. You're the one I've heard about. Can you heal me? Jesus says to him, Do you want to be healed? His question back to him is not, again, you're Jesus, can you heal me? He gives a complaint. I come here every day. They stir the water every day. And there is no one that can take me down to the water. At this point, I'd be thinking, well, you're pretty ungrateful. Good luck tomorrow. See you later. That's not Jesus' response. Jesus doesn't say to him, look, do you know who I am? Hi, Jesus, son of God, pretty cool. Healed a leper a little bit ago. I don't know if you heard about me. He doesn't say that. He simply gives them a very simple direction that to people standing around must have seemed really stupid. He said, get up, pick up your mat, and walk. I'd be thinking, if I were the cripple guy, well, if it was that easy, I would have done it 13,869 days ago. But that's the simple direction that he gives them. Even though this crippled gentleman does not know who he is, he has enough faith in the power and presence of God that's standing there before him that he gets up, picks up his mat, and walks. He doesn't ask him, how do I pick up my mat? He doesn't say, walk what direction? He doesn't say, what do I do after that? All questions that kind of when God shows up and asks us things, we got, he just says, okay, and he gets up, and he picks up his mat and walks, and he's instantly healed. That is awesome. That is a miracle. And the people around immediately say, there's a problem. Not that he got healed. Not that he picked up, well, it was the fact that he picked up his mat and walked because it was the Sabbath. It was the day in Israel when you weren't supposed to do anything like that. He had violated what God had commanded, because he did work. He picked up his mat 
and walked. Well, maybe Jesus didn't know it was the Sabbath. Maybe when he gave him that direction, he just kind of forgot what day it was. But Jesus knew it was the Sabbath. He knew exactly the command that he was giving him. And so the accusation is not immediately then against the man. It is against Jesus. And in John chapter 15, oh, excuse me, chapter 5, verse 17, Jesus gives this simple response. My father... My father is working until now, and I am working as well. Or yours might say, I am also working. Well, you know what? That statement that Jesus made was a bigger problem for the people that were standing around than get up, pick up your mat, and walk. Because if you were a good Jew, if you were one that followed the commandments, you would never, ever, 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 ever refer to Jehovah as my father because that was just too personal. Our father who art in heaven, that's okay. We can talk about our father who's up there, but to call him my father is to have a personal relationship with him that at that time they didn't think they could have. They didn't think that they could have that level of relationship and trust me, Jesus knew exactly what he was doing when he was saying, my father. As we celebrate Father's Day, we celebrate my father, both our earthly fathers that we have here among us. For some of us, we have had a great relationship with our fathers. For the others of us, we've had a relationship with our fathers. For others of us, we've had no relationship with our fathers. And in some cases, we might have had a bad relationship with our father. But we still celebrate that today on Father's Day. But we also celebrate our Heavenly Father. Someone we either do know, hopefully well, personally, if you are a Christ follower or a Christian, or somebody you need to know well and personally if you've not yet accepted Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. I'd like to take a minute to tell you about my father. Now everybody goes, aww. Now stop looking at Natalie, and the person sitting next to her is, uh, is my father. This is Dr. Robert Carlson, retired professor of organic, organic chemistry at Kansas University. When I was growing up, he was a classic old-school father. He came home from work. We ate dinner. He went into his office and did work, talked some around the table. We did always eat at the table uh, and was there. He rarely said, I love you. Uh, he left really the raising of the children uh, to my mother. Uh, but one of the things that I will always remember is that every year he came to uh, our elementary school, my sister and I's elementary school, and he did a chemical magic show. And he brought in chemicals from Kansas University and did things like grew mushrooms and brought in liquid nitrogen and took roses and froze them and smashed them. And like for a day, we were like the most popular kids in school. For me, it was only a day, but hey, one day out of every year is not bad. Uh, you know, and uh, he, during high school, uh, drove me to work every day, uh, uh, to school every day on his way to work, and then he would let me hang out in his office afterwards. We would sometimes walk over to the Kansas Union and get a snack. The biggest thing I remember about that is my dad drove the speed limit, no matter how late we were to school. No matter what. If it was 35 miles per hour, he went 35 miles per hour. If it was 40 miles per hour, he went 40 miles per hour. And even though his son's going, you know, Dad, five miles per hour over the speed limit's okay. They really don't give you a ticket then. And what drove me nuts as a teenager is when I got my license and I was driving, I was driving behind him once. And he was speeding. And I came home. And I was their typical kid. I was mad. I said, Dad, I was driving behind you today. And he goes, oh, really? I said, you were going over the speed limit. When we went to school, you... he says, well, I had to set a good example for you, son. <laughs> I said, thanks, Dad. I really wanted that good example of high blood pressure and stress as I'm late to school. That was awesome. He took us to baseball games. The question that he always asked me is, when I came home for an event was, how many people were there? He used to drive me nuts. I go, I don't know. My standard answer after a while was more than two, less than a million. 
technically accurate, while not helpful at all. But you know what? When Natalie goes to events and comes home, guess what question I ask her? <laughs> I try to phrase it better. You don't have to give me an exact number, honey. Just in general, how many people were there? I want to know the same thing my dad does. But if there was a concert at our school, if I was in a home sports event, if I was uh, getting an honor for something, my dad was there. I know that he loves me. I had a very good relationship with my father. But I just want to tell you about my father up in heaven. My father up in heaven, I accepted his adoption at age 18. He gave his son as a sacrifice for my sins. He has an awesome plan for my life, even at times when I don't follow after him as I should. He is the creator of heaven and earth. He knows the beginning from the end. He is my provider, my healer, my comfort in times of trouble. He is triune, three in one, and I know that he loves me as well. So I want to continue on in the story of that Jesus follows up after this amazing statement of talking about my father. And again, I want to encourage you this morning, if you cannot refer yet to God as my father, listen to what Jesus gives as an example here in the next couple of minutes and consider that it is an awesome choice to make on a Father's Day. John chapter 5, verse 19. Jesus then is responding to everybody being upset over him saying, My Father. In part, some of that uh, from the religious officials is that he is claiming, of course, then to be the Son of God. When we refer to God as My Father, we are saying, ipso facto, ergo therefore, if he is My Father... I am his son or daughter. Now, Jesus was claiming it in a way that we can't. However, we have that same access as well. Jesus responds to him and says, Truly, truly, I say to you, the Son of God can do nothing of his own accord, but only what he sees the Father doing. For whatever the Father does, that the Son does likewise. Fathers, your children are watching you. The video clip I find funny because every one of us can identify with probably at least one of those statements that our dad made, and probably more than one uh, that's on there. But that, they, there's no book. Kids, I don't know if you know this, there's not a dad's book, Annoying Sayings, to really aggravate your children. It just kind of is the way and the plan that God has designed. No matter what society tells you, God designed the family unit for a very specific person, purpose. To raise godly children. To have mothers and fathers and aunts and uncles and grandparents present that model the Christian life for them. And when that doesn't happen, there are other things that happen in society as well. But fathers, your children are watching you do all the things, not necessarily all the things that you want them to see. But God designed humans that way to do it. We have to set the example. As Christians, as Christ followers, Jesus set an example for us. Follow the Father's heart. Work where he, was do it. Work where he is working. Do what he does. Too often as Christians, we get up in the morning and we think, what am I going to do for God today? What am I going to accomplish today? And very rarely do we ask, what's God doing today? What does God want to accomplish today? You know, I might think I need to drive here and go do it, and I might pass three other people that God wants me to talk to on the way there because I'm focused on what I want to do. Dave will tell you a story of driving to church and passing a woman walking on the road and that God told him, you need to stop and pick her up and take her to church. And Dave said, no, that would be stupid. First of all, there'd be a woman alone in the, in the car with me. Second of all, why do I want to do that? At which point God said, really loudly, do it, and he did it. Sometime ask Dave the testimony that comes out of that as well. We have to look for where God is working. And you know what I found? God oftentimes doesn't really care about my plan and my agenda. But whatever he is working at and doing is awesome. This is a theme that Jesus has throughout his ministry, and really gets emphasized, I guess would be the best phrase to use in the book of John. And John, let me get to the right place. Doop, doop, doop. Go 
In John chapter 5, verse 30, Jesus points out, I can do nothing on my own. As I hear, I judge, and my judgment is just because I seek not my own will, but the will of him who sent me. That would be his father. In John chapter 7, verse 28 and 29, it says, So Jesus proclaimed as he taught in the temple, You know me, and you know where I come from, but I have not come of my own accord. He who sent me is true, and him, and him you do not know. I know him, for I have come from him, and he sent me. And you know, that statement was controversial to them because when he's saying you don't know him, it means you don't really know him. You know who God is, but you don't know him. And one of the challenges on Father's Day as we think about our Heavenly Father is you can probably not find anybody in America that does not know who the concept of God is. I would almost believe that you can't find anybody in America that doesn't even know if you're talking about Jesus, that you're talking about the Christian Jesus. That doesn't mean that they know him. It just means that they know of him. In John chapter 8, verses 20, uh, 28 and 29, said, So Jesus said to them, When you have lifted up the Son of Man, then you will know that I am he, and that I do nothing on my own authority, but speak just as the Father taught me. And he who sent me is with me. He has not left me alone, for I always do the things that are pleasing to him. Oh, how great it would be if when we get to heaven we can honestly say that all we did is what God wanted us to do. And then finally in John chapter 14, verse 10, he says, Do, not believe that I am in the, uh, do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? The words that I say to you I do not speak on my own authority, but the Father who dwells in me does his work. We honor our Heavenly Father by working with Him, making disciples, and spreading the gospel, what He has called us to do. There are so many different ways to do that. We try to provide as many different ways for that here at Christian Life as well. Our motto is that we love God. That means that we get to know Him, that He is not just something far off, but it is a love born out of relationship, that we love people, because God loves people. If God didn't love people... He would not have sent his son to die on the cross. He would have just let us all go straight to hell. And we encourage to serve with passion. To find a place where you can serve God. It is great to love him. But as many of you know, you can love somebody, but if you don't ever tell them that, if you don't ever show them that, if you don't ever demonstrate that, how much do they believe you? We can tell God while we're worshiping. We can tell God while we're praying all we want that we love him, but if we worship him, we pray, and we walk away and we do our own thing, God's sitting up in heaven going, really? Hmm. The Greek language that Jesus is using here uh, that when they wrote the Bible and we're talking about is one that demonstrates an a supreme example of a son copying the spirit of what his father does. Fathers, if your sons and daughters spent all their time copying exactly what you do, would they be accomplishing great things for the glory of God? Or would they know how to search for good YouTube videos? Something to think about. But Jesus gave this as his example. When Jesus healed, it was a reflection of Jehovah Rapha, our healer. When Jesus gave comfort, it was a reflection of Jehovah Shammah, the Lord my companion. When Jesus fed the 5,000, it was a reflection of Jehovah Jireh, our provider. When Jesus calmed the storm, it was a reflection of Jehovah Shalom, the Lord our peace. When Jesus rode into Jerusalem, it was a reflection of Jehovah Nisi, our banner. When Jesus gave his final sacrifice, it was a reflection of Jeho Jehovah, I love this one, put it up there so I can pronounce it right, Mechadishkem, the Lord who sanctifies. That was his ultimate sanctification purpose. And when Jesus gave the Great Commission, it was a reflection of Jehovah Rohi, the Lord our shepherd. What Jesus demonstrated when he was here on earth was the reflection of all the names of God that we had for him before, that we find in the Old Testament, that are describing to them. He didn't invent new things. He reflected the Father to us. Earthly fathers, this starts at home. But it goes beyond that, because we as dads, we as men also have the responsibility to help out those children that don't have that example within their lives. 
get involved with children's ministry. There are a lot of children that come on Sunday mornings and Wednesday nights when it returns in the fall that don't have a male example at home. But there's a whole bunch of them sitting in this church right here. Does it take time? Yes. Is it at times annoying? Yes. But what you're accomplishing for the Lord is awesome things. Jesus goes on in John chapter 5, verse 20. He goes on from that and says, For the Father loves the Son and shows him all that he himself is doing. And greater works than these will he show him so that you may marvel. You know, it's hard to imagine the whole process that Jesus must have gone through when he came down to earth. You know, it's one of those things that we especially talk about at Christmas time when we have the little baby Jesus becoming so helpless. But I always think about, and I don't even remember who sang the song so many years ago, it talks about the fact of leaving heaven, all the place that we want to get to. You know, we as Christians, our goal is to get through life and to get to heaven, and that's a good thing because heaven is a good place. But Jesus was already there. He was in that good place. He was in paradise, and he left that to come down to earth, to be with us. And at times, I think Jesus must have asked God, what are you thinking? Because it's rough down here. And if you think it's rough down here now, think about what it was like at the time that Jesus was down here. Under Roman rule, you walked everywhere. If you wanted to know something, you didn't Google it. If you wanted to go someplace, you didn't get in the car. You were walking on roads where animals had walked, and if you can't figure that one out, go to a farm. These are all things that Jesus had to deal with, but he knew in this statement that God loved him. That God loved him. What allowed him to make the entire journey to the cross is that he knew that God loved him and that God loved us enough to allow for that sacrifice. Earthly fathers, your children need to know that you love them. It doesn't mean you have to get up every day and go, I love you, I love you, I love you. Hey, I love you. Because again, you can say that as much as you want, but if you're not ever there when they're doing events, if you're not ever asking them what's going on in their day, if you're spending most of your time looking at your cell phone, they may not necessarily know that. I know that we live in a new era. As I said, my dad was an old school approach to that. Very rarely said, I love you. When we talk on the telephone and, and things are coming to close, my mother always says, bye, I love you. Dad says, bye. But I still know that he loves me. We now, but that, guys, it's not an excuse. We can still do that. But be supportive. Look for them. Christians, Christ followers, God the Father set the example. Jesus knew that God loved him. He had relationship with him. He communicated with him. Throughout that relationship, he showed him his work. The love that is talked about here, if you go to it in the Greek, is not the agape love, the unconditional love that God has for us. It was the phileo love, an intimate friendship or fellowship. He was saying, that's the type of love that I have with my Father. It's not that, he's God the Father, and I'm the Son. It was a friendship, a relationship where they worked together. God was working things out up in heaven. Jesus work, was working them out down here on earth. You know what? Today, God and Jesus are working them out up in heaven. We're working them out down here on earth when we have that relationship with Jesus Christ. I want you to think about where you are in a very standard kind of Christian arc that we see so many times. We get saved. We're pumped. We're on fire. We want to know as much about God as we can. We annoy the living daylights out of older Christians. We read something in the Bible and say, Hey, do you know, they get, you know the older Christians are like, Yes, I know that it says that. And then you go, Hey, do you know that it says that if we ask for anything in God's name, that he'll give it to us? Well, of 
course I know that. Hey, do you know that it says that God can heal us? Well, obviously. God. I mean, we are just so pumped about that relationship. We want to know everything that there is to know about him. And then kind of that relationship just kind of moves along. And sometimes we become a little more distant. And we read that again. Oh, we can ask for anything in, in God's name. Yeah, I remember reading that. And then a couple of years go by, we read that. Oh, yeah, you can ask for anything. And all of a sudden, we're those ones that have become a little more distant. We don't get together with them quite as much. We don't build that relationship quite as much. And then in the times that we do, for whatever reason, have that devotion time, that quiet time, it's really just kind of a catching up time. Hey, God, since last we talked, I, I just want you to know that I've been to church three times, and I gave 50 cents in the offering, and I was going to give a dollar, but I couldn't get it folded into the football in time. So I just grabbed some of the change and put it in there. Our relationship, we not only need to be able to see God's work, but participate with him to do that. We really have to have that relationship that, God, that Jesus is talking about here. If we truly, truly know that God loves us, we need to reciprocate that love back. Notice that what he begins to say here is pretty incredible. Not only does he say that God loves him, but he also says, uh, he shows him all that he is doing, and greater works than these, the healing at the pool, telling the man, pick up your mat and walk. The guy picks up his mat and walks away. Greater things than this are you going to see. This happened before many things that we think of as being known about Jesus and his ministry. This is before, literally a chapter before, but a little different in time. Jesus feeds the 5,000. But that's coming. When God is saying that greater things, Jesus is saying greater things than this, before he fed the 5,000. This is before Jesus walked on water. This is before Jesus heals the man born blind. This is before Jesus raises Lazarus. This is before the triumphal entry. This is before the resurrection. This is before the pouring out of Pentecost. This is before all of the miracles of the apostles. This is before all of the great things that Christians have done throughout the world up until this point. All those things are still available, and greater things than these do we still have access to. It is a transfer of lineage from the Father to the Son. Earthly children, you need to remember to give honor to your fathers, not just today, but each and every day. God put them in your life for a reason, to annoy you, no, to help and raise you and bring you up. I know, we all, uh, some of the kids already were thinking that, yeah, they put them in my life to annoy me. You don't know my dad. You're right, but I do know that he is your dad. Earthly fathers, you need to transfer that lineage to your children. We have that time that we are telling them about God. We are telling them about Jesus, but there comes that time that they have to own their own faith. We have to challenge them to say, I know you have you've believed this because I've told you, but now you need to believe it to, for yourself. Because eventually we're not going to be around. And those of you with adult children know there's that time that they question their faith. And there's that time that you've cried out and say, why did you make that decision? Or there's been that time that you've cried out and say, thank you, God, that they made that decision. That's up to them. Our job is to love them through it, no matter what decision they happen to make. The third verse that we're talking about, Jesus goes on, John chapter 5, verse 21. For as the Father raises the dead and gives them life, so also the Son gives life to whom he will. The Father has given authority to the Son for a purpose. Earthly fathers passing on a relationship with Jesus Christ is giving authority to your children. Not your authority, but the authority of Jesus Christ within their lives. And trust me, your children need that as they're walking through the schools. Trust me, your children need that when they have all this free time in the summer. Trust me, your children need to have that authority of Christ within their life so that they can stand strong on what God has promised for us. But we also need to pass on that life to them. We have already had the one part in their life, which is what made us fathers. But the more important part in that life is passing on the gift of eternal salvation if our children are open and can hear it. When he is talking about raising the dead, Jesus will have times of absolutely raising the dead. 
Lazarus is a classic example. Dead and in the tomb, wrapped up, and Jesus called him forth. But more than that, Jesus gives the authority to raise all of us from the dead by the gift of eternal life that we have been given for them. This for our children's salvation and for the great works God has in store for them. You know, when your kids are annoying you, it's really hard to look at them and think, boy, God has such great things planned for them. Rather than thinking, what on earth are you doing? I would like to say that I have uh, never lectured my daughter. I have never annoyed my daughter. The verse in the Bible that I wish God had left out is the one that said, fathers, do not exasperate your children. I don't think God knew how fun that is. But he put it in there, so I do have to follow after that. I'd like to say I did, but I have had times that I have probably yelled at her too much. I have probably more than exasperated her. But that doesn't change the fact that it, we can say sorry. We can say, I shouldn't have done that. But more than that, say, God has a plan for your life. Because I know that God has incredible things planned for my daughter. I'd like to tell you I know what they all are. I was kind of thinking when she was first born, you know, I'm tall, Jane's tall. She could be uh, in the WNBA. She could make lots of money. So it's up for retirement. That's probably not going to happen. <laughs> But I still love her, and I have no idea what God has in store. I just know that it's there. And my job is to keep encouraging her to seek after what God is. If I speak it to her, it's what Dad wanted me to do. You know, my dad had things that he wanted me to do. <clears throat> I'm not really doing any of them. You can call him up and ask him. Trust me, I'm, I'm really not. Neither his son nor his daughter are any good at chemistry. My dad really kind of had that hope. My sister went a little farther in that direction in college and then found out she wasn't any good at it either. But on the flip side, both of us are teachers. My father spent I don't know how many years as I, I texted him this morning and he'll probably text me at about three o'clock in the afternoon because that's how often he does tests. And I said, how many years were you at KU again? And uh, I like to tell you I'm going to put it on Facebook, but I won't so you can all read it, but that's okay. <clears throat> but even though he didn't tell us all that we wanted to be teachers, we saw that as an example. And honestly, speaking a little egotistically here, we're actually both pretty good at it in what we do. We need to give that type of purpose to our children, Christians, Christ followers, raising the dead. How many of you believe, really believe, just think about it, don't raise your hands, that right now if one of the people in here dropped dead, that we could raise them up? I know that most of us probably believe that that's possible, but not probable. But that's not what God says. That's not the example that he gave. We love when the missionaries come, and they speak to us, and they talk about the fact that that happened in one of their services, and they raised them up, and we all go, praise God. And most of us are going, I hope we don't ever get called on to do that here, because I'm not sure it would happen that direction. I'm just being honest with you. I know that some of you probably really, really do, but look at Paul when he is standing before the Romans, Acts uh, chapter 26, verse 8. He just makes a really blatant statement. He says, why is it thought incredible by any of you that God raises the dead? He's talking to the Roman Empire. He's talking to the people that crucified Jesus. He is defending the fact that he was sent by the Roman Empire, to eliminate the Christian church. And he kind of turned away from that and went in the opposite direction. It just, I, it's not a matter-of-fact statement. He doesn't give a whole lot of things. Don't you know that he did this? He just says, why, why on earth do you think it incredible by any of you that God would raise the dead? More than that, God is also talking spiritually. John chapter 14, verse 6 and, uh, and 7. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one, no one comes to the Father except through me. If you had known me, you would have known my Father also. From now on, you do know him, and you have seen him. Jesus is talking about the fact that we do all have access to that eternal salvation that comes from knowing Jesus Christ. See the Father at work, and go there and work with him. Raising the dead seems impossible. 
Jesus threw that out because that was probably one of the biggest religious debates of the time. We have other ones, but between the Pharisees and the Sadducees, it was whether or not the resurrection would happen, and if so, what happened to the resurrection. He's using that as a powerful term. But we know that there is one way to heaven. I don't want to overly go obnoxious on politics, but I was saddened as I was listening to the funeral of Muhammad Ali of how many people stated that there were multiple ways to heaven. And I, I'm not pointing a finger at uh, any individual that's passed on and say, I know what the, their eternal outcome is, but I am saying that Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And that's awesome. You know, I like having easy answers. I don't give that to the kids when they have tests. They have to write full essays and things like that. But the answer is easy. How do you get to heaven? Know Jesus. Accept him as your personal Savior. Paul says, if you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that Jesus Christ is Lord, you shall be saved. We don't have to wonder, oh, am I following the right religion over here? Or am I doing this right over here? Or am I doing this right here? Jesus says, there's one way. You just have to follow it there. And then after that, we see the Father, my Father. We go there and work with him. As I said earlier, I don't know what your relationship with your earthly father is or was. Some of those relationships were great. Some of them are still fixable. Some of them may seem beyond repair except for the power and the influence of God. And some of them, due to eternal separation, may be impossible to fix at this time. But we live in a broken world, but we have this promise from God. We need to remember that no matter what your relationship was with your earthly father, this is your relationship with your heavenly father. Romans chapter 8. What verse did I start with, Ben? Uh, uh, 14. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. For you did not receive a spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons by whom we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God, and if children, then heirs and heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with him in order that we may be glorified with him. No matter what your earthly relationship is, you are guaranteed a relationship with the Father by accepting his adoption. I said, I did that at age 18. It took me a long time. I had a thick head. I was actually raised in a church where I wasn't told you needed to have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. But we have that ability to have that relationship with my Father. If you go ahead and stand, we're going to go. You're going to be able to beat everybody to Red Robin. It's going to be awesome. It's going to be good. You can meet the guys in back that have the, uh, the gift baskets and see if there's anything that they don't want in there. But as we go to the Lord in prayer, and then we have, uh, I have a benediction video for you afterwards, let's just spend some time with the Lord and say, God, we thank you that you love us. Lord, we thank you that not only do you love us, but that you have a plan for us. Lord, I thank you that not only do you love us and that you have a plan for us, but Lord, you continue to work within the world today. That, Lord, that you have a plan for our lives, which is not for us to go out and work on our own, but is to follow my Father and do what he wants us to do. Lord, this morning, for those that Father's Day brings up ugly memories, Father's Day brings up frustrating memories. Lord, I just ask that by your Spirit you begin to heal those relationships. Lord, not that forgiveness means forgetting what happened, but forgiveness means that we are working and moving in the power of my Father up in heaven, who forgives my sins as well. And Lord, for those that have great relationships with their fathers today, I ask that you would bless that, that you continue to encourage that, And Lord, for the fathers here, I ask that you would indeed continue to give them an opportunity to either invest into their children's lives or to invest in their children's lives and the lives of others as well. And I thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. If you just remain standing, Pastor Steve will be out there. We encourage you, if you're a visitor, uh, to do that.
Uh, but instead of a prayer in closing, uh, I have a Father's Day benediction video for you once it's over. Uh, you'll dismiss, but please watch that first. Go ahead, Ben.